Um, but I do believe that there was some pressure coming from the military to say it's about time. I don't think he exactly double-crossed them. Um, I think it was probably them exerting some pressure. The, these are, were his closest friends, many of them. So I think they probably um, were quite frank with him and said, this is not going to go back to the way it was before. That's my suspicion. Yeah, there are a number of prominent Egyptian intellectuals, um, uh, amongst them uh, the Nobel Pri uh, Prize winner for chemistry. Um, people who are very well respected in the society because of their scholarship, because of their international reputations and whatnot. Um, so those were the people who were being called in. They have a lot of popular support. I don't think any of them are viable political candidates. But I think these are the kinds of people that you would want involved in any kind of transition. Um, um, very simple question. Large our contents. Um, we had Tunisia. Uh, today, Iran started. Mm -hmm. We had Iraq, of course. We had a whole bunch of other youth movements, peaceful revolutions in other Islamic countries. Um, the <coughs> other thing is, they being had set up one of the Nobel Prize, right? They for me to say what is going to happen in other countries because we, we do see the, the winds of change. Yemen, Jordan, King Abdullah dismissed his whole government with the, within days of the Egyptian protest, right? Um, Algeria. Um, so you have these, these demonstrations going on, but all of those countries have very different cultures, have very different histories, and, very, and are constituted very differently. Um, so I can't say if they, uh, the results of those demonstrations, will have the same result as in, uh, in, in Egypt. Um, as far as whether this is going to threaten Israel or make it more secure, I will say this. I think, at least from the Egyptian perspective, um, Egypt is not going to get behind the United States as far as um, being quiet and um, having close relationships with Israel. Hosni Mubarak's regime was very close to, to the Israelis against Hamas. It is widely believed that Hosni Mubarak was acting in concert with the Israelis during the invasion of Gaza. Because Hosni Mubarak does not want a Hamas controlled Gaza on Egypt's border. Osman Mubarak has been a supporter of, of the Fatah party in the West Bank, not Hamas. I think now is the opportunity for Israel. I would say this is an opportunity for Israel, rather than feeling threatened or, or whatnot. This is the opportunity for Israel to do something about the Palestinian issue. It is the number one issue that has galvanized um, Arabs even though no one wants the Palestinians in their country. The Egyptians don't want the Palestinians, the Jordanians don't want them, the Lebanese don't want them. But everyone wants something to be done within the Palestinian territories so that there is not this, this daily brutality. Michael. I wonder if you could uh, expand a little bit about the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it's an important question that we understand who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, you took their website and you sort of painted them a bit like Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm going by what they have put up there. Right. But of course it's a larger question. Here. Yes. Could you help us to understand why they are perceived as such a threat other than perhaps that they are popular among the people? What their popularity among the people is unknown. No one is really able to say how very popular they are. What would have happened in the last parliamentary election if they hadn't boy had not boycotted and had actually let their candidates run, we don't know. 
we have no barometer as far as how they are uh, perceived amongst the populace. Why, why are people afraid of them? Um, a, I think because of their radical roots and their use of violence in past decades. Okay, that's, that's part of their history. Um, and that can't be uh, dismissed. Um, I think what is one of the other reasons why the Brotherhood is so feared is because all of these very extreme Muslim groups in Egypt are simply lumped in with the Muslim Brotherhood. And the, in other words, the Muslim Brotherhood is, um, uh, is equated with all of these more extreme groups, what we call the, the Salafiyya. The ones, the men who wear long beards, who wear the short dalabia, that's not the face of the Brotherhood. The face of the Brotherhood are professional men in suits for the most part. But I think even from the Egyptian perspective, particularly from Egyptian Christians, when they hear the Brotherhood, they are thinking Gama'a al-Islamiyya, not the Brotherhood itself. So what the fears are, the fears are certainly uh, from, from a Christian perspective, of the Sharia, how extensive it has become in Egypt, is it going to affect our lives? I, I can only go by what the Brotherhood says it's about and, and their actions. And their actions in the most recent decades has been a political movement that has been trying to enter into the political process. I don't think you can say anything more. They have not been involved in, in any kind of violence. Um, since the 70s. They have been consistently thwarted in their attempt to enter the political process during Mubarak's regime. But certainly their charitable works in Egypt have been remarkable. There was an earthquake in Egypt in the late 90s, and something like two to 300 people died in, in Cairo. The Brotherhood went into neighborhoods, set up clinics, set up um, uh, stations for clean water, for food. The government came in and cleaned them out, said you have no right to do this. The government did not replace those basic services. So the Brotherhood has gained some popularity through these kinds of social services. Whether or not Egypt would get behind them uh, in order to uh, have a uh, the controlling interest in the government, I don't think so. I don't think people the, the young people leading like the April, uh, the April movement, I don't think they are at all Islamically oriented um, because they, they look to, to, to us and express themselves in very secular ways. Um, that's the best I can do. The Brotherhood is a great unknown, but I think um, the fears are exaggerated um, because we don't have any evidence that would substantiate these huge fears? Great. Can you touched on something I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you spent a lot of time <clears throat> among Coptic Christians there. And I'm curious if you said a little bit more about how they view both Muslims in general, you know, are they more kind of let's get along or they feel threatened, and how they feel about the Muslim Brotherhood. Do you have anything you can share with us? All of the Coptic Catholics that I spoke to, that I have been in contact with during these protests, are completely fearful that the Brotherhood is going to take over Egypt and set up some kind of Islamist regime. Coptic Orthodox also are fearful of the Brotherhood from, uh, from that perspective. As far as Muslims in general, Coptic Catholics have a terrible attitude towards Muslims. They don't interact with them unless they have to. They think I'm crazy that I go visit mosques. Yet, what we saw during the, during the protests were many Coptic Orthodox, at least, and, and Protestants coming together to uh, support the protesters in Liberation Square to put themselves between the protesters and police. And we saw it very dramatically um, on, on that Friday when, uh, when uh, a, a 
I believe it was Friday, no, it was this Sunday, uh, we saw a demonstration with a Coptic liturgy. Muslims were there praying with the Christians. It's a mixed bag. You can't generalize at all about Christian-Muslim relations in Egypt. Because Christians and Muslims live side by side, they work with one another, they socialize with one another. Are significant segments of the Christian community fearful of, of uh, Islamists? Yes. Are there fears grounded? There is a history there. There are these sectarian clashes. The question is, who is fomenting these clashes? And a lot of people think that the government has deliberately done that in order to keep Christians and Muslims separated, because once Christians and Muslims come together, we have the Yes, sir, way after that. You talked a little bit about <clears throat> sort of uh, the military using equipment against its own people. And I'm wondering if you could kind of further that, because my understanding was that in Egyptian society, the military was well respected, and that they were actually, the scenes that I saw on television when he finally stepped down were, you know, the, the protesters, you know, reading the military with glee. I'm wondering if that was sort of a misplaced statement, or if you could expand on that. The military command has been very closely allied with Hosni Mubarak for 30 years. He came from their ranks. These are his, his Air Force buddies, his Army buddies. So the command, it, I would say, is not friendly to the, uh, to the interests of the pro-democracy reporters. Their interest would be in maintaining the status quo. However, the rank and file military are drawn from the, from the ranks of the Egyptians. Every Egyptian man has to serve in the military for two to three years. So those soldiers that were out there in Medina Tahrir did not want to fire on the, the people who might be their neighbors, their family members, their relatives. And the protest movement that we saw made it a particular policy I mean, these protesters were extremely well organized. They, they issued manuals online. This is what you wear to the protest. This is how you comport yourselves. No inflammatory language, no weapons, and hug a soldier when you come up against them. That was part of their, of their strategy. So uh, the Egyptians love their military because it's them. Did we, we see one in Turkey where you've got a, a, a predominantly Muslim uh, population, but a secular government mm -hmm. that, that has a strong respect for the military. Do you think that's a, a possible model for Egyptians to look towards? It would depend upon how it, it comes about, because in Turkey's case, it was forced secularism. And Turkey has had significant struggles since Ataturk's time because of that secularism had been forced. It, it, one would rather that the people have a voice in determining what their society will be like, um, rather than saying religion has no place. I don't think the Egyptians are going to go strictly for the Turkish model, um, because Egypt is an inherently religious society, both Christian and Muslim. And please make no mistake about it, Christians in Egypt are as sharply focused on their religious interests as Muslims. And they want to preserve their way of life as much as Muslims want to preserve theirs. Um, as 
far as the military command? Well, the, the entire military structure. Um, what I understand, they have a significant role in the Egyptian economy. At least it had them. Well, the, the military command would be amongst Egypt's wealthiest. I mean, all of these men are multimillionaires or billionaires and have extensive commercial interests and control in Egypt. Um, their interest would have been to maintain the status quo. Well, I think they couldn't do it. Maybe I could make it more specific. Mm -hmm. A while back, I heard the information that you surprised me that after the uh, 66, 67, mm -hmm. yeah, 67's world struck, the army had so many extra recruits that they didn't want to flood them. Egyptian church broke away from the one church, and that is the origin of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Um, in addition to the Coptic Orthodox Church, which had its own pope, um, there is a minority of Coptic Catholics that are in union with Rome, that is, uh, recognize the pope, um, the, the bishop of Rome, as the leader of the church, as pope, but have their own particular liturgy. Yes. I wish I knew. <laughs> um, it's in, we're in a very, very delicate stage here. Now, understand that since their revolution in 1952, Egypt has lived under Gamal Abdel Nasser, Anwar Sadat, and Hosni Mubarak. Under those three men, you had a very autocratic style of government, some more benign than others. But as far as your average Egyptian actively engaged in a democratic political system, they had no real experience of that. It's going to take a while. Um, in order to sort this all out. I think, and well, let me say I pray and I hope that the military remembers <coughs> those protesters in Medan and Tahrir, because I don't think those people are going to put up with any kind of autocracy or any kind of military rule for very long. That's not what they, what they protested over three weeks for. So how long this is going to go on, I don't know. I don't think the, uh, the protesters will allow it. We might see people going back into the streets if it drags on. They're calling for, they're calling for elections um, uh, within uh, the year. Um, I think you know, this is going to be a tremendous feat because you need to organize campaigns, you need to figure out who the candidates are going to be, you need to figure out the logistics, all of that. It's going to be a very difficult process, um, and I doubt it's going to go as smoothly as the protest one, because we still have many of the old guard still holding on to some authority. The cabinet is still in place, which to me is remarkable. Ben, did you You know, I, 
I was searching valiantly today to find out, to figure out what happened to Omar Suleiman. Because he came out and in 20 minutes, in 20 seconds, he said, Hosni Mubarak has resigned and transferred presidential powers to the military. What happened to Omar Suleiman? He is still there somewhere. I put, I put you, you might have noticed, I put his date down of office as very short because I don't think he's considered the vice president. The troubling um, a comment that I heard today is, uh, I think it was the ministry, the minister of foreign affairs of Egypt said that the army is going to decide if Suleiman has any role in the new government. I can't see it happening. People will go wild. People will go wild. Just as it seemed like. But who knows? Um, let me just see. Yes, sir. Just a question on the Muslim brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Especially a group of men who killed uh, Scott. No, I think they were members of the Muslim brotherhood. They just they were just people out of the street. Yeah, right. No, they weren't part of the uh, Brotherhood. They might have been part of Gamal al Islamiyah, but not part of the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood uh, was not involved in those kinds of activities um, by that time. They had they had renounced violence. I'm not surprised because again, the Brotherhood becomes kind of this umbrella term used for any Islamic extremist. I guess the fear that some people have. Yeah, it's not true. Um, and they, they do advocate Sharia law, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of people would assume means another Iran or another mm -hmm. that is another hypocrisy that has just replaced uh, Mubarak and, and his ties. The, the brother. Is that silly? Is that um, I think it's an over exaggeration. Um, again, because the Egyptian constitution already says that the Sharia is the principal source for all legislation. Now, I mean, Egypt is, is a very open society for the most part, except for the emergency laws. What does the Brotherhood mean when it says it wants uh, Sharia implemented in Egypt? We don't know what that means. They are not, they have called for equal rights for Christians and Muslims. That's not Sharia. They have called for for full, um, uh, full freedoms for women in, in the political and civic realm. That's not your traditional Sharia perspective. It is Quranic, though. Equality of men and women is a Quranic basis, is based on the Quran. So perhaps the Muslim Brotherhood's version of Sharia is more authentically Islamic than what we see going on in Afghanistan and in Iran. But to, um, to say that the Brotherhood is the only um, political force that could possibly rise to power, I think is, is inaccurate. We have the Fat Party, and we have the Wafists, and we have independents. But they boycotted the election. The only reason there's any of them is because they broke ranks with their party. So we don't know what political force could come in because Hosni Mubarak has not allowed there to be any organic process by which political parties could rise to a power. We just don't know. We've been sold the bill of goods. It's Mubarak or the Islamists. But certainly what the protests have shown, even in the dialogues with Suleiman, has shown that there are many voices out there. And the Muslim Brotherhood said, we just want to be one. Again, the, 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 the book on the Brotherhood is yet to be written. They're the great unknown. At least the way they are presenting themselves publicly. They seem like they are reasonable as far as their social and political agenda <coughs> is concerned. Committed to the democratic process. And the problem is that there are people who say, we want democracy in Egypt, but we don't want the Brotherhood. Well, I, I got into arguments with my Egyptian friends. How can you say you can have a democracy if you start to pick who you want 
included in, in your society as far as a political voice is concerned. That's not democracy. Then we're going back to Mubarak's regime, where he decides who can have a voice in the government. Okay. Chris, I think we'll make you the last one. Oh, just a quick comment on the question. On the, uh, on the question that you were asked now, we have this sense in America that Sharia is some coherent body of uh, regulation. In mm -hmm. reality, there are five main schools of Sharia, and mm -hmm. we kind of equate it with what the Taliban did. Exactly. It's a kind of a weird, perverted brand of Sharia. Exactly. There are plenty of countries where the Muslims run their own affairs by Sharia, which would be things like marriages and divorce and this kind of ordinary life kind of thing. Yeah, we do have this ugly sense of what Sharia is because most of us have the experience of uh, the, the Taliban or um, Iran. But Sharia governs, for example, the right to a woman inherit her husband's property. The right for a woman to, to for the, the the obligation for a man to give his wife property when they enter the marriage that remains hers. That's covered under Sharia. Sharia guarantees women's rights within their marriages. It also governs religious laws like fasting and praying and all the things that we would call canon law in Catholicism. But we only see it as the, the harsh end um, associated with the Taliban. What does the Brotherhood mean when it says it wants to see Sharia implemented in Egypt? Again, I can't tell you. I don't think anyone knows what they mean. The other, the other observation is, even if they were championing some weird radical kind of version, the reality that hasn't been mentioned is that you keep saying, you've got the military there and you've got people voting. Mm -hmm. Between the fact that the young people voting and the military, it's just hard for me to fathom any kind of scenario whereby any kind of a heavily, radically Islamist group could come into power and gain power and maintain power. It doesn't appear that way considering the way the protests unfolded. No organization, whether they were the Salafiyya, the most extreme Islamist group in Egypt, and we know that there are, they didn't push any agenda, they didn't advance anyone as, as a leader, the Brotherhood did because everyone recognized, I think, that this was a movement of the Egyptian people, and that was the primary concern. Will some people want to see a conservative Islamic rule established? Some people. I can't imagine that's the majority of Egyptians, unless they're sold a bill of goods. Mm -hmm.